Hey y'all, Billy and Michelle from Permapastures Farm. Today we're gonna to talk about seven must have plants for your survival garden. So we said seven, but we may actually drift into a lot more than that. Now, the whole reason I'm doing this, there are numerous people many of them reaching out to me as of late, feeling a sense of desperation. And so if you'll see a pattern in a lot of the videos that we've done as of late, whether it's the compost video, whether it's the, um, the gorilla gardening, you name it, everything that we have been doing is not only permaculture, but there's also a preparedness component that's already baked in to the permaculture model. So I'm here with my beautiful permaculture designer, homestead honey wife, you think I can get that on a t-shirt? I don't think so. Anyway, here we are standing in front of the area now. This is an area basically all alongside this mountain and we've covered it ad nauseum really, where we're basically taking an orchard and we're gonna go all the way to the top of this mountain, but it's in transition. It's not fully developed yet, it's coming up. Now we had Justin from Metcalf Mills go and build us a terrace up here and we're gonna have subsequent terraces all the way up the mountain as we clear it. Now we're gonna cover way more as far as succession, what we started with and where we're going. But today it's all about the gardening. It's all about things you can do for your survival garden. Now in that previous video or a couple of videos back, you've seen me do all these um, gorilla gardening. Well, some of the things we're planting today, you didn't see this part of it, but these are some of the things I went back and planted later. Okay, for a whole variety of reasons, which is what we're going to get into. Now, on Patreon, I've talked about this book ad nauseum. Well, maybe not quite that bad, but anyway, The Independent Farmstead. This is where, I, okay, let me just kind of back up. I thought years ago that I invented what they had already come up with years prior to me thinking that I invented. I didn't even know this book existed um, until maybe, I don't know, three, four years ago. Well, yeah, about four years ago. What I didn't realize is in this book, they don't say it. In fact, I'm not even sure that they use the word permaculture, but that's exactly what it is. In this book, they provide you an exhaustive list of all the wonderful things that you could be planting that not only your animals can eat, but that you can eat as well. They have a brilliant, beautiful model. Now, we also have an insert here. Why don't you tell them about that? You can find this on their website. Um, I think it was like maybe $10, but we'll, we'll provide a link down below, but it specifically covers food that you can grow for your farm animals. Okay, so first up, we're gonna plant Trombacino. We originally got our seeds from the independent homestead and they recommend Trombacino for a variety of reasons. Number one, it is a heavy producer. Um, you can get hundreds of pounds from one single plant. It keeps well. Uh, Trombacinos are also resistant to squash bugs, vine borers, and bacterial wilt and mildew. So that's pretty important, especially in our um, climate where we get frequent rains and I've seen a lot of different uh, squashes, hard squashes that um, suffer from that bacterial wilt and mildew. Another thing is you can eat it, humans can eat trombacino, you can pick it as a summer squash like a like young or you can wait till it develops fully and, and it matures and you can uh, save it it keeps well. One thing I want to point out right here in this particular area, this was all a thickety mess and you've heard me go over it over and over again. Um, that's the cool thing about what she's planting here. It doesn't really matter the soil. Now she's putting a little bit of um, uh, yard, garden soil in there, but by and large, it doesn't have to be high quality soil for a lot of this stuff. That is another one of its wonderful virtues. But where we are and the reason why it's being situated here number one we live in the mountains and these are this is very extreme terrain so we know what we know about the qualities of this is when this stuff binds out we don't want it down here because over there is kind of something of a parking lot for us we want it up here where it can work its way down now already in here you've seen me do this in a video a while back we have buckwheat and cowpea all throughout here and in fact you can see a lot of it coming up right now 
I'm not sure from your perspective you can see it so well, but trust me, the buckwheat and the cow pea are coming up right all through this. So it can be part of your forest, your uh, food forest design if you want to. You can mix this thing on the hillside like I showed you in that last video. Really, the, the sky's the limit for all that you can do when it comes to a lot of this. We're taking gorilla gardening, combining it with all kinds of stuff right now. So while she's doing that, I'm gonna get set up for the next one. All right, here we are on the terrace. And like I said, ultimately this will be a food forest or orchard all the way up the mountain. Now, what's the beauty of this terrace? What, what can I use it for? Okay, my pick is gonna be, bam, these Kushal seeds I got from Justin at Metcalf Mills. This is one of the varieties that we got. I mean, he's got this eight generations of mountain wisdom there and the things that grow well here, well, we're listening to him. And this is one of the things that he's been growing a long time. Now this squash, man, we pick up some of them, man. They're about 40 pounds. Here's why I pick it. Here's why I like it. Number one, I like the flavor on it. Number two, it can be used something as like the way you use pumpkin, pumpkin pie, but you get a ton out of it. Here's what's cool about a terrace, y'all. Now, as you can see, I got my seed over here and I'll continue that in a minute, but here's the beauty of it is that when this binds out, bam, where's it gonna go? All I gotta do is kind of help it guide it and I'm gonna have my Kushaws and wait till y'all see the size of these bad boys. They're gonna be situated right here on this terrace. It's generally a walking path. You know, having to step over 40 pound Kushaw squashes ain't a bad day in my view, but it's also one of those ones that Justin, he's had some, I mean, man, he's filled up entire trailers with them and he selected them based on all the wonderful things that you want out of something like that. For example, in his case, that thing keeps over a year. So why wouldn't you want that? A 40 pound squash that tastes good, stores a very long time, maybe not as long as a Tromachino, but it stores a very, very long time and it's something you can eat a lot of. Now folks, before we move on to the next one, also consider the, the one thing for some reason everybody forgets about is fat. Think about your shelf stable fats and where you can find it. Because I got news for you, the hardest thing to find in nature is fat. So think about those nut trees that you could be putting over here. Right here, we got a chink pin. We got hazelnuts down there. We got all kinds of nuts that indigenously grow to this area. But think about those long-term perennial fat nut crops that you can be getting out of that. So with that said, I'm gonna drive on Kushaw's all the way, y'all. Take number four. Anyway, um, we'll get back to the terrace in a minute. Um, we're at the next one right now. And this one isn't, well, it's pretty well known, isn't it? Potatoes. Yes, I would say it's pretty well known. Um, my, what I would be doing and what we are doing is planting potatoes everywhere where we could possibly plant potatoes. And you, I would like those, if I had limited space, if I had a balcony, I would be filling up those big, I don't know what they are, 20 gallon containers with soil and planting potatoes everywhere I could possibly find a space to uh, find a space to plant them. Uh, we have one bed right here of potatoes and we also have some horseradish growing in there. Now horseradish helps keep uh, bugs away from your potatoes. That's one reason to grow it. Another reason is just because I like it. And a third reason is it helps with, like if you have congestion of any kind, horseradish will clear you out. So three reasons to grow it right there. Yeah, also let me point out too, everything we're also pointing out in this video, y'all can be done in the gorilla gardening. Now, when you do potatoes, Think of the average person out there, and most people have no idea where their food came from. This is one of those things. Now, you know you wanna be careful about that soil. Think about it. Imagine you're a person out there that has never grown these before. They'll never take a second look about this. This is another brilliant idea in your gorilla gardening, should you choose to do it. Remember, when you do gorilla gardening, if you're trying to keep it more clandestine, do not put things in lines and rows. Nowhere in nature are you gonna find that there's nothing wrong with it, but when you're looking to stay under the radar, don't put things in lines and rows. All right, y'all, we're gonna knock out two birds with one stone with this little experiment with, that we have going on right now. Now, this is Comfrey, and down in here, William came up with this great idea of um, growing sweet potatoes as well, which you see right here. 
Now they're not doing super great at the present moment because we just now trimmed back the leaves to provide some sunlight for these sweet potatoes. So the idea being in this particular case is that when we harvest the comfrey, we can harvest the sweet potatoes all at the same time. Maybe a win-win, we don't know for sure. But the point being is that sweet potatoes, y'all, you saw me do this in the Gorilla Gardening. That was one of the ones I used. It is, it's one of those things that if you live in a place like we do, everybody your new great grandmother will walk past that and just think it's some sort of ivy, okay? You could sit there and grow it right under their noses. Now, from a survival standpoint, not only are sweet potatoes basically a superfood, but you can eat the, uh, what do you call it? The, the you vines. can eat the vines. You can feed it to your animals. Um, they're pretty doggone good. And then along with that, obviously, you get sweet potatoes out of the deal. How beautiful is it with a sweet potato? I mean, look at all the work of George Washington Carver, but also consider the fact that you can eat the vines while the tubers are growing. Win-win. Like I said, another awesome gorilla gardening thing. And if you want more information, if you want the consummate experts on all things, all things sweet potato, get that sweet potato manual down there at Deep South Homestead. You're going to be glad you did. And that's another thing with the other manual. These things cost next to nothing and they pay dividends on for you in ways that are unimaginable. The $10 investment into something like that or whatever the cost is, you're going to make it over a thousand times you really are because also danny in that manual he covers propagating your own so you That's don't right. have to keep buying your own sweet potato uh slips he teaches you how to produce your own so that you're not relying on any outside sources to grow sweet potatoes all right the next star of the show is comfrey okay look y'all um i'm not trying to beat a dead horse and i'm not trying to oversell it we're going to do a series of videos in every possible way. We're gonna, we're gonna spread them out. We're not gonna push it because there are times where we have to wait for certain times of the year to get the best out of it. Now, the reason, one of the reasons I love it so much is it is literally a living green mulch. You can plant it around your fruit trees and you've seen me talk about this before where we chop and drop it, stick it down there. You'll never have to mulch a tree again if you grow enough of it. Plus, I mean, this beautiful leaf has so many other wonderful values. We just recently did a video on the many, many uses of comfrey. Just to just to highlight it, we feed it to our animals. We you can make a, a tea out of it, a compo or a comfrey tea for fertilizer, but you can also make one that you consume yourself. And it does not, it tastes pretty good actually. It tastes a little bit like spinach, which I had heard it was horrible, which is why I hadn't tried it up until just recently. But um, comfrey has a lot of minerals in it. It's a one of the few sources of vitamin B12. So that is highly beneficial in your survival garden. Also, let's not forget about all the other wonderful benefits. There are reports of people taking this stuff and eating it like spinach. We haven't yet tried that, but I think we're going to. Um, like I said, the, the the benefits are legion and we're not trying to oversell it, but also consider it as a must-go tool if for no other reason than for the fertilizer reasons, <laughs> reasons in your survival garden. Okay, we're back up on the terrace and the next plant that I'm gonna talk about is the Cherokee Tan Pumpkins. We got these seeds originally from uh, from Deep South. Wanda gave me some some seeds, and we planted them last year. And we planted them in poor soil last year, and I, they were so prolific. So I'm excited to see what they actually do in in decent soil. Some of the benefits of Cherokee tans. First of all, the flavor. The flavor is is a very strong, similar to probably like a, a sugar pie pumpkin. It's smaller. So this is gonna be a benefit to maybe if there's only one or two of you, or if you're if you're an older woman that is doing this by yourself, they're they're a much smaller pumpkin, so they're more manageable rather than hauling around a, a 20 pound hard squash. Uh, that's another thing that I, I really like about them. You could cook it up and it would just serve, it would be enough for like a day or two, the meals. Um, another thing is they're pretty, they seem to be pretty disease resistant. I don't, I don't think I had very much 
bacterial issues with them last year. Another thing about the Cherokee tans is they keep for a ver for months and months. And um, last year we even had them like in the, I, I picked them, we were about to get a freeze and I picked them while they were still green and let them ripen. They ripened up and we, and then they kept for, for quite a long time. All right, number seven on the list is a little bit different than the other ones, okay? It's a tree kale. Okay, we've grown all kinds of kale you can imagine. I mean, even up in Kansas, we were chipping ice off of it and we were still eating this stuff. But this is a perennial kale and it gets rather tall. It produces prolifically. So not only is it good for us, but it's also good for the animals. Now, there's vitamin C in a lot of the other stuff that we have out here, but this has particularly high amounts of it along with, you know, something like this, uh, like a key lime. See them little limes coming up over there? Like a lemon to a lime, a lime to a lemon. Lemons, limes, all those things that you can use to get vitamin C. Remember, that's how they got scurvy back in the old days. It's pretty cool historical reasons why the Brits were able to conquer much of the known world. And a lot of it has to do with some of this stuff here. But anyway, the tree kale, what else can you tell us about it, honey? Um, so the variety that I have is perennial. So you plant it once and it just keeps coming back. And, and also, like uh, Billy said, it, it's pretty hardy. So it would continue to grow. Our winters here, we might get a couple cold days and then it will warm up in like the 40s and 50s. So it will keep growing through the winter in our climate. Now, another thing to consider, y'all, we... As permaculture designers, we are trying to wean ourselves off of annuals. And as, I think- As much as possible. As much as possible. Now, I'm always gonna wanna eat a potato. I'm always gonna wanna eat sweet potatoes. There ain't no getting around that. But there's a lot of other things that could even fill some of the gaps in some of those areas too. But we're looking and we're replacing, like even within our tree systems, we're doing centropic things where we grow annuals within there. But the ultimate thing is that we're, we're still on the annual, but we're leaning off of it to get more into perennial solutions. Number one, it takes a lot of work out of your hands. Number two, it's easier to go out there and maintain, especially if you can find those things like I was telling you. For your climate, I'm sure it's something different, but like that Kushaw squash that grows exceedingly well in this environment. Well, I guarantee no matter where you live, by and large, there's something that is going to do exceedingly well. But let's come full circle with all this. The whole reason we've done this and the reason you've seen the direction of a lot of the videos that we have going on here um, is because we are offering as many solutions as we possibly can. When I get letters from 73 year old women that have lived in one spot their whole lives and all of a sudden find themselves by a series of unfortunate things that are unfolding right now, finding themselves in new areas and feel largely as if Man, I really need to come up with new solutions. I've spent my whole life in this environment. I know everything about it. Now I find myself in this new one. And I don't necessarily have resources or ways to feed myself and my family through all of this. That's exactly what you see us doing, y'all. When it comes to the compost down there, the 18 day that we're producing, whether it's the compost in the chicken tractor on steroids, whether it's the eggs or the meat we produce out of that system, whether it's raising all these ruminants, on grass alone, or whether it comes to raising our pigs on food scraps that we get as a byproduct of some of the other places that would ordinarily throw it in a dumpster. There's a tapestry, a theme, a, a, a thread that we're weaving with all of this stuff to make you more prepared in these coming times. I'm not going to belabor it. If you have any sense at all, you can look around yourself in that grocery store and you're probably asking critical questions, okay? We're not people that buy meat out of a grocery store by and large, but even we are seeing and feeling it. Even when I go in there and buy these massive rolls of toilet paper that we need for William, who unbeknownst to me seems to have teeth in his butt. Nope, so nope, nope, because I have a bidet. <laughs> these filthy heathens don't use it. <laughs> Is there anything you can add in regards to um, the theme of these videos and what we're trying to do and the, and the, the reasons we're doing it? This is, this is all I can say. I, if I had limited space, I would be finding space and taking space. I don't care what the laws are. I would be taking, I would be finding land and I would be planting stuff there 
for to to harvest in the future. That's spoken like a true libertarian. But that's really it, y'all. At the end of the day, and this is why we do the I don't need the gorilla garden. We got more than enough land. But it's also fun to get myself outside the box a little bit and do some things that might make you like jumping out of a plane. If that's what it might be to you to go out there and requisition some land. You paid taxes on it, so you just as well do it anyway, whether it's on the side of an interstate or some public land that nobody else is using. And now, there have been a couple of people that have that thought they're taking me to task on that. Well, you can take me to task on these no <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> Let me see. It, for, just to give you an example, let's say you're in the city and there's a vacant lot. It, what, why can't food be grown in that vacant lot? Why can't you plant a little bit of food there? Potatoes, sweet potatoes. I don't care what the laws are. It's, if, if, if growing food in that lot is breaking a law, we have some serious issues and, and there's unjust laws. And I would say that that's one of them. Or if you're out in the country and you see people aren't using land around you, use it to, I would be planting food every single place that there is a spot to grow food. It's funny you mention that because I have a friend from way back who ended up moving to a place in California. Now the city, the government had no problem whatsoever when the crackheads took over this house. But they didn't decide to bulldoze the place until they made a community garden out of the front of that house. So you can sit here and play along and think, okay, am I doing the right? Look, if you're not, do no harm, first of all. But if you're able to do this and see to yourself and the people around you, I got news for you, folks. It's about to get real, nephew. And I'm not going to go on to all the gloom and doom. If you got any sense at all, you see it happening. But there's ways to mitigate a lot of what could happen. We've been providing a lot of those. There's a lot of other good channels out there that are doing the very same thing. So we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to drive on. Now, we're getting kind of low on comp. Well, I think we're actually, as the shooting of this video, we are currently out of stock. We're going to see if there's some places we can get it. We're not going to rape our land trying to produce more comfrey. So hopefully we have more. Bone sauce, world's best deer repellent. Look, y'all, they're on all the boxes. They're on all the trees. We're not trying to oversell this stuff. Look, for us, it has performed miracles because we couldn't grow a fruit tree on this property until we took that bone sauce, found a way to make it, and put it on these trees, and we haven't had a deer problem. In fact, we haven't had any kind of problems. We haven't seen a deer. No, we haven't seen a deer on this problem since. So, we got that also. You need any of the things we have down below. And folks, also, I'd be remiss if we didn't say there's also that Self-Reliance Festival, Camden, Tennessee, this weekend coming up. So there's still, I, as I understand it, there's still going to be tickets at the gate if you want to get to that. So we're going to be processing a pig there, but there are going to be really, really, really awesome, cool people at this event. And hopefully I get to see you there. So until next time, this is Billy and the homestead honey, Michelle from Permapastures Farm, where permaculture is my passion.